Beautiful pearl that would please a prince, fit to be mounted in finest gold. I say for certain that in all the East her precious equal I never found. So radiant and round, however revealed, so small, her skin so very smooth. Of all the gems I judged and prized, I set her apart, unparalleled. But I lost my pearl in a garden of herbs. She slipped from me through grass to ground, and I mourn now with a broken heart for that priceless pearl without a spot. I went to the spot my words describe, entered the garden green with herbs, in the month of August, on holy day, when corn succumbs to the sharpened scythe. Suddenly my spirit rose from that spot, while in body I remained asleep on the mound, and by God's grace my spirit embarked on a quest to where marvel and amazement happen. Layers of leaves like burnished silver shivered and shook on every bough. When clear daylight glided across them, they glinted and glimmered with a dazzling gleam. The air was so fresh with the scent of fruit, it nourished and fed me as if it were food. All shape and size of shimmering fowl flocked and flew as one through the wood. No stringed instrument making it sound could mimic the glorious music they made. When they beat their wings, out of those birds came a song of heavenly harmony. The ornamented dazzle of downs and dales, of wood and water and splendid meadows, infused me with bliss, eased my burdens, soothed my sorrows and dispelled my hurt, and I followed that freely flowing stream, light-headed with elation, alive with joy. There was more splendour displayed in that scene than time would ever allow me to tell, and a human heart could hardly hold one-tenth of the rapturous gladness it aroused. I felt, therefore, that paradise itself must be there beyond those broad banks, and supposed the stream a border of sorts, a dividing line through lovely lands, and that somewhere over the shore of the brook I would find the site of its walled city, the water was deep, and I didn't dare wade, but more and more I longed to cross. 
A more marvellous matter amazed me now. I stared, astonished, and the longer I looked, the more I recognised and remembered her. This appearance, I thought, is an apparition, and fear held me. How would I feel if the vision before me vanished from view, without contact or closeness occurring between us? Then she rose up in resplendent robes, a precious being in priceless pearls. Priceless pearls, imperially worn, were a marvellous sight, a miracle to the eye. Her figure as vivid as Fleur de Lis as she walked forward towards the water. O oh, pearl in those priceless pearls, I said, are you really my pearl, whose passing I mourn and grieve for alone through lonely nights? Endless sorrow I have suffered and endured since you slipped from my grasp to the grassy earth. Then that jewelled one in her noble gems looked up and gazed with those grey-blue eyes and spoke without sentiment saying to me, But gentle jeweller, if you are dejected at the loss of a gem which lent you such joy, then your mind pursues a mad purpose and troubles itself with a trifling cause. O oh, best and blessed one, I said to her, you dispel my grief and great distress. So I ask you please to pardon me for believing my pearl was Oblivion's prize. Now that I've found it again, I'll rejoice and dwell with that beauty in the bright dells, and love my lord and all his laws who has brought blissfulness back to me. Jeweller, that glittering gem, then said, Why must men joke? You must all be mad. Firstly, you feel you have found me in this valley, having seen the evidence with your own eyes. Secondly, you state you will stay right here and live your life alongside me in this land. Thirdly, you think you will bridge this brook. No gentle jeweller could make such a journey. You say out loud you will live in this land. I think you must plead for permission first, and such a favour could well be refused. And you wish to pass over this watercourse, but first you must plot a different path. Your cold corpse must sink through the soil. It was forfeited by our ancestor, Adam. With judicious words I said to my jewel, let there be no offence to my lord if I rage and rave with spluttering speech. But my heart is heavy, and talk rushes headlong like water from a spring, surging and spewing. I fall on his mercy, this moment and forever. Never reproach me with wounding words, despite my errors, my gilded angel, but kindly offer your consolations. May bliss find and follow you, sir, said that figure of lovely limb and face. You are welcome to walk and wait in this place, for now your speech is pleasing to hear. I was young in years and innocent at heart, but my Lord the Lamb, by divine love, brought me to marriage and made me his bride, crowned me his queen to bloom in blessedness, today and tomorrow, till eternity. My bliss, I said, can your tale be true? Don't take offence if I speak out of turn by questioning if you are heaven's queen, worshipped by everyone the world over. We believe in Mary, mother of all grace, who bore a child while pure and chaste. No one could vie for the virgin's crown unless they surpassed her in some noble aspect. Rare and unrivalled, 
unique in her sweetness. She has come to be called the Phoenix of Arabia, a peerless creature that flew from her creator, as did the Queen of Courtesy. Courteous Queen, said that lovely creature, kneeling on the floor, raising her face. Matchless mother and fairest maiden, fount from which grace and goodness flows. Sir, many seek grace and are granted it here, but in this domain there are no usurpers. All heaven belongs to that holy empress, and earth and hell are within her dominion. No one will oust her from her high office, for she is the queen of courtesy. The company of the court of God's kingdom live by a custom unique to this country. Everyone who arrives and enters here is called the queen or king of the realm, and no one person shall deprive another, but derive pleasure from a neighbor's possessions, and wish their crowns were fivefold in worth if such an improvement were possible. But my lady, mother of Jesus our Lord, she is highest of all throughout this empire, and none of our company is sorry that is so, for she is the queen of courtesy. Courtesy, I said, it seems certain, and heartfelt charity are at home here, but without offence let me offer these words. You lived for less than two years in our world, knew neither your creed nor paternoster, nor how to pray or to please God, but were dubbed a queen on your first day. There is no limit to our Lord's love, were that worthy woman's words to me. In God's domain, more and less have the same meaning, said that noble maiden, for every person is paid equally, despite how much or little they deserve. Enough is known to acknowledge that man was first formed for a life of perfection. But our forefather, Adam, forfeited bliss by tasting the forbidden fruit on his tongue. By eating that apple, he damned us all to die in sorrow, deprived of delight, then fall to the flaming fires of hell and be punished without reprieve or escape. But salvation was ours eventually, when crimson blood and clear water dripped on the cruel cross of Christ, because God's grace was great enough. From that broad wound, enough bright blood and holy water welled earthward. The blood released us from relentless hell and saved us all from a second death. The water that streamed, it is worth saying, spilled on the spear which spiked our Lord to banish by baptism those deadly sins of Adam's making in which we were mired. In a blessed hour he restored our bliss, and now there is nothing in this wide world that stands between us and ecstasy, for the grace of God is great enough. O pure and incomparable pearl, bearer of the priceless pearl, I said, whoever fashioned your fine features and wove what you wear is a miracle worker. Your beauty was never derived from nature. Pygmalion failed to paint such a face, and not for all his letters and lectures could Aristotle tell of your attributes. My peerless, incomparable lamb, she declared, my dearest destiny and lord, he beckoned me to become his bride, a match that many might find unfitting. Come to me now, my beloved, he called, there is no blame or blemish in your being. He bestowed both strength and beauty on me, washed and cleansed my clothes in his blood, then crowned me a pure and virgin queen, and cast me in incomparable pearls. 
Bright and incomparable bride, who enjoys such royal rank, I replied, what kind of lord or king is that lamb to want to wed you as his wife? That incomparable pearl then spoke, I am unblemished and without blame, honours I hold with my head held high, but incomparable I never implied. The brides who live with our Lord in bliss are a hundred and forty-four thousand strong, as is written in the book of Revelation. Saint John saw them gathered together on the hill of Zion, that sacred knoll, and in the Apostles' dream they were dressed for their wedding ceremony there on that summit, in the city of New Jerusalem. To find a view of that flawless place, walk upstream alongside the water to the valley head till you come to a hill, and I will follow on this far bank. Yes, just as the Apostle John described it, I saw for myself that exalted city, the new Jerusalem, luminously rich, as though descended from heaven's heights. Its buildings gleamed with pure gold, blazing and glinting like burnished glass. They stood on a base of precious stones, formed of twelve well-fastened tiers, a firm and cleverly fashioned foundation each stratum cut from a seamless gem, as in the writings of Revelation, where John the Apostle depicts the Apocalypse. And all was transparent, so my gaze passed through wall and structure without obstruction, till I saw with my eyes the high throne, arrayed in awesome ornaments, as John the Apostle correctly recorded, with God taking his place upon it, and running directly out of that throne was a river more radiant than sun and moon. The riverbanks were bordered by bright trees, which bore on their boughs the twelve fruits of life. Twelve times a year those trees offer harvest, their riches returning monthly like the moon. Had I put his pleasure before my own, and yearned only for what was yielded, and acted only with honest intent, and done as my perfect pearl had pleaded, then I might have lingered longer in his presence, and witnessed more of his mystery and wonder. But a fellow will always seek further fortune. I reached for more than was mine by right and that glimpse of life in the land everlasting was shattered in a moment, and the gates slammed shut. Lord, they are mad who meddle with your laws, 
or propose to spoil a prince's pleasure. To please the prince and join him in peace is the simple choice for his faithful flock, for day and night he has never been less than a god, a lord and a loving friend. Here on this mound this happened to me. At first I pined for my fallen pearl, then gave her up to go to her God, with my blessing and also the blessing of Christ, who the priests proved to us time after time, his body as bread, his blood as wine. May we live both as his lowly servants and beautiful pearls, pleasing to him. Amen. Amen.